All right, good evening, everyone. How's everyone doing tonight? Welcome to North Carolina Cryptid and Paranormal Project. I'm Tom. I'm the host of this show and podcast. Um, we have Lance Hightower on tonight from the uh, Oklahoma uh, Brothers and Cryptid Investigators, and he also does uh, the Alaska Triangle series on is that Travel Channel. Mm -hmm. Okay, That's well, right. well, we're going to be doing some interviewing, some questions, some talking, a little bit of Q and A, a little bit of discussion, maybe some. Um, you know, checking up on some of his old um, encounters that he, he's been through over the years. And on top of that, I just want to welcome Lance Hightower. It's an honor to have you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it very much for being here. And uh, like I said, I wish I, uh, my goal is to do more interviews, uh, but I, you reached out and you were very persistent. So I couldn't <laughs> turn you down and I really wanted to talk with you and finally everything worked out. So I'm glad I'm able to do this for you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, so I guess we'll get down to the nitty gritty over things like, you know, I've done this. I've only been doing this podcast, this, this, this group for, you know, not, not a couple months now. And I had another partner, we were doing a show together, but we were having issues with timing and whatnot in different times and scheduling. And I have a family and, uh, he's on Texas, so he's an hour behind me. So it was always kind of like, you know, battling for times to get, to get it to certain times, but Hey, Lieutenant, what's going on? Um, that being said, I would just, you know, have, have people on people, give me encounters, um, you know, talk to some, some people that are, uh, you know, well-known investigators and researchers and just mm -hmm. picking people's brains, you know, getting, um, just getting more knowledge and actually getting the truth out to the people because the, the best thing to do is get the truth out. So people, you know, when they're out in the woods or they're out doing something, they see one of these things, you know, it's a life changing experience. You don't know. I mean, these you know, oh, people, right. people see these things and, you know, it's like they don't know who to talk to because, you know, you go tell your friends and they're going to think you're crazy. So the one reason why I started this group was to kind of keep like a safe, uh, safe zone and a, a place where people can, you know, tell their stuff and not worry about being ridiculed, not worry about, you know, this one and that one saying, you know, you're a loon, you're crazy. You, you, you just saw this it was pareidolia. So right. that and this is the same reason why we started in many ways. And actually we started our show in January, 2017, basically as therapy for my brothers and I of things that we experienced. So it was just going to be technically a conversation with us, but it, the way it developed is that I just had an idea that, no one had a toll free number. And I thought, you know, I didn't know at that time a lot about computers. Uh -oh. And I thought, you know, if, 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 if the experiences that I think that people have had out the woods, all they know, they know how to dial a phone number, but they may not know how to do email. So when I put that out there, I was overwhelmed. But that the same premise was that I want to help people. I want to give them a safe area, non judgmental. And if possible, I want to give them some advice that's commonsensical about how to approach something uh, or how what to do, what is logical to do. And more importantly, through doing this now, who not to talk to. And yeah. you know what I'm talking about there, uh, because you don't want to brag about a lot of things because you'll have people come knocking at your door. Exactly. And that's what you don't want. You don't want people knocking at your door. You don't want to have, say you have a nice piece of property out in the middle of the country and, you know, it's your property and you've seen something there and you tell a certain individual or certain um, agency. And before you know it, you got the whole, you know, full ongoing investigation, military, blah, 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 Black Hawk choppers flying, you know, kill teams flying around at night with silencers and lasers. And, and before you know it, it's all just wild times. Uh, numerous, there's a handful of the times if it gets loud here, I've got a train that'll go that's, by. That's so, if, so sorry about that. Um, so yeah, absolutely. And that's something that's, uh, really you, it's, it's kind of thick to lay on someone when someone has an encounter for the first time and you're trying to tell them that they're not crazy. They saw what they saw. We have had our own experiences, but then on top of that, you kind of layer the icing on the cake when you go, Oh, by the way, you got to have to keep quiet of this. I know you're telling me, but yeah. here's the deal. There's some people out there that's somewhere behind the scenes of the government that wants to suppress this and they may come knocking at your door. So you got to keep this under wraps. So you've got to kind of, you know, how do you eat an elephant is one bite at a time. You don't want to gag right. something. So right. you try to just layer it as they can swallow 
and that's the one thing that I that I, I talk about too. If if I feel that they're ready to receive that, so it's just kind of a feel there. Absolutely. And on top of that, like you got to be careful who you're talking to because some of these some of these groups are actually being infiltrated by people that work for these agencies as, you know, posing as a normal guy. And they'll ask you, hey, where do you live? I want to come do an investigation with you before you know it. You know, I've <laughs> you got the whole week. <laughs> and I, I've gotten blamed one uh, at least twice that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. um, I, Quick, what happened? I had I did an interview. It went really well. The guy invited us to come out. This was in Oklahoma, and he had a, a close encounter. It was uh, actually a very peaceful encounter, mm -hmm. and uh, it wasn't too far from where I live. And about two months later, he leaves a message on our toll free service that said, basically, I'll never forget it. I played it, and it said, Lance, I'm very, um, I'm very disturbed that you're working with these people. I am going to expose you for who you are. Uh, I would have never shared my story with you. I've had more Blackhawks and, and Hummers and people walking on this property in military gear than I've ever seen in my life. Oh, God. Uh, they won't tell me what they're doing, yada, yada. <laughs> so, uh, what happened is that I can only surmise that our conversation was overheard. Right. And that after we spoke a few weeks later, they, uh, we didn't talk about specific, he didn't share with me the details of where this sighting was, nor did he tell me exactly where he lives. My, okay. he just said the name of the town and that was it. Right. And it's, it's quite a big town for Oklahoma. So he had helicopters, Humvees, uh, military uh, vehicles with, um, government tags, blacked out windows. And so anyway, oh, yeah. uh, he thought I was part of it working for them and, I uh, I left a message back. He wouldn't answer that. I'm so sorry. I'm not obviously, but I know it can look that way. So yeah, um, there was there was definitely some infiltration going on. Maybe a phone tap or wire tap or yeah, who knows a bug in the guy's house. But you know that's that just that just comes with the territory when you do these kind of things. You know, we were green to it in the very beginning. Uh, I, I we didn't know back in 2017 how deep the rabbit hole really goes or went and so it was an eye-opener to us it was very surreal it was very it almost appeared very fictional on the outside but the more that we got into the rabbit hole the re we realized that this is very real these people are very real they're very serious they're not your friend no want to be your friend they're there to do a job and that is through either coercion intimidation and they'll do it in any way possible they use high technology to surveil you to surveil people that you know and that's how they know about things before you even talk about it oh yeah i mean i mean that, that's nothing i mean the way to ai and technology is nowadays you talk about something you got your phone on you open up facebook guess what what yeah. you were just talking about is is, is, is is big. There's an ad on your phone, and it's like, oh, you want to buy this? Okay, here you go. Many times. You hit it right on the head. That's happened to us many times. I'm like, wait a minute. I wasn't looking for window blinds, and all of a sudden, I'm getting ads for window blinds, but we yep. were talking about it. Yep. So, yep, you hit it right on the head there. So, people, I just tell people that, and just put it out there, if you have had something, I know you want to share immediately. And, and if there was nobody hurt in the situation, what I would recommend is just um, try to get your scruples, uh, share only away from phones, turn them off, put them in a microwave, don't turn the microwave on, but just put them somewhere, put them in some type of Faraday bag right. that, uh, that you can muffle sound and then take a walk around the house and tell a loved one, someone that you can trust. And then, because you're going to want to instantly spill out what you saw. It, it's oh, just yeah. human nature to feel that connection. And then try to lay low with your story for a little bit. And then get away from phones. Don't post anything on social media. And then over time, try to get your thoughts again. And then share with someone that's of a like, either someone that you trust or someone you worked a relationship with that kind of has an understanding or had their own experiences away from phones. 
So that's my suggestion. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's, it's a really good suggestion because it, it keeps everybody on both parties safe and, and free from harassment. I mean, speaking of harassment, how is your friend from episode 24? I mean, I, I posted earlier, it's the Ohio Bigfoot attack. So if you want to go into a little detail, how it kind of started and how he's doing nowadays, because, I mean, this was a crazy experience. I mean, this guy was harassed. His, it wasn't his job harassed. He had, his family was harassed. It was ridiculous. So if you want to go into that, we can kind of delve a little bit and show yeah, tell everyone how, how bad these things can get and start to tell the wrong person or if you run right to the, you know. Yeah, uh, so I'll just briefly recap. Uh, this was, uh, let's see, this had to be, when was, this occurred on October. Oh, gosh. I think it was October 6th of 2019. 18. Okay think and uh, anyway i spoke to him he called me three days after this event happened so we were fortunate and um who directed him who gave him our number was a police officer a local police officer <clears throat> excuse me and that's kind of what set everything in motion unfortunately it set a lot of things in motion uh some of which was going to happen anyway, and some of which just because he was sharing it, it and other people found out. But uh, the police officer that shared this lost his job. I could, I mean, this could literally uh, be a movie. Uh, oh, absolutely. It, it's incredible. But I spoke to him three days after. The first uh, interview I did was raw. The I've never placed the message on prior to a show except for that one, that episode. What you hear when that starts is the actual message that was left for me. And I could hear the fear and terror in his voice. Uh, and so I kind of introduced myself. And what you hear is what you hear. Mm -hmm. uh, him and a cousin were out fishing midday around this reservoir in Ohio. And it was uh, quite a bit of a big island out in the center. And it was about 2 o'clock. They were fishing. And I'm going through it kind of fast here. But they had pebbles being thrown. Uh, one cousin was in front, one was in back. It was like a John boat. And he told the other cousin, quit throwing the rocks. Well, long story short, he said, I'm not. And he saw something up on the bank and he thought it was a bunch of kids or a guy. So right. he said, put me up there. I want to pick their hind in. So he put him up there and the other cousin said, don't do it. Let's just keep fishing. He said, no, I'm getting up there. And he took a handful of gravel and he threw it at this tree where he thought this person was. Unfortunately, it was a Bigfoot. And the Bigfoot, how would you look at that? A sign of aggression. So the Bigfoot stepped out and just bent down and just yelled at them. The lips curled, he said, and he could see the nose nostril flared. He said, this looked like a four by eight sheet of plywood that stepped out from behind this tree. And it, they were just froze and they didn't know what to do. Wow. Um, so the Bigfoot ran so fast in such a split second hit that one cousin in the chest and made a 90 and stopped and growled again. In the meantime, when one cousin looked, tried to find the other and he looked back and he was in the water grabbing his chest. He had broken ribs and punctured a lung. So the other cousin got in the water, got him on the boat. They were thrown some debris hit the, the cousin. They got hurt, knocked cold cocked him. He put his body in the, John boat, they went back, they called the police, they called the sheriff, they called an ambulance, called the game department. Everybody was at the boat ramp. They went to the hospital. A lot of things ensued. And uh, later the room was cleared out and two gentlemen came in. Mm -hmm. And when I say the room was cleared, the police was cleared out, which is rare. Yeah. And they split. One stayed in the room with the cousin that was injured. One took this gentleman that I interviewed to the next room. And he basically said, um, uh, you're going to be quiet about this. What you saw was a bear. Mm -hmm. And the cousin yeah. said, no, 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 you don't get it. We saw this creature and it did this and this. And he goes, I'm hearing you and you're not hearing me. What I'm telling you is that you saw a bear and it'd be best to keep this quiet. So instantly he's, what are you talking about? But before that happened, this police officer in the hallway said he slipped him a note. He said, I think these guys might be able to help you. So and that was ironically the toll free number. So 
over time, what happened, and I'll just get to the heart of it. We had this interview. I, uh, I tried to take out as much as I can. I took out his name. I took out the location because I was still concerned as new fresh as this happened, yeah. he would be targeted. Well, real quick, this guy didn't even believe in Bigfoot until this happened, right? Isn't that correct? He, he didn't even know like Bigfoot existed. Bigfoot existed. Right. He wasn't – I don't want to say he was a uh, disbeliever. Right. He really didn't have a, an opinion, so to speak. Mm -hmm. It was just of the mind that, oh, it's just a wives' tale. You know, kind of one of those things. Right. Uh, but in a split second, he found out they were real. They can cause physical harm. They can cause damage to you. And they are a monster. And, and you find all this out in a split second. And in addition to that, you find out that there's an agency, mm -hmm. some government agent. He didn't know it was government or not, but there was an agency that didn't want you to talk about it. So he was totally puzzled and still under shock and all this adrenaline. And you could tell in the voice because that is all raw audio uh, with the exception of editing some of this. Oh, yeah. Stuff. But uh, so fast forward uh, during that first interview, his wife didn't understand. His pastor didn't understand because he was just what I call verbal vomiting. He was telling everybody what's going on and he was feeding them an elephant in one swallow is the way I put it to him. And he, he agreed later. And so his wife divorced him. Uh, he lost his job from that he had for 15 years, been on time for years. The boss couldn't tell him why he lost his job. Big clue. Uh, so therefore he lost his house. He lost his truck. And then he en ended up sleeping with a friend at his place. I mean, the guy was homeless. Um, and so uh, I've stayed in contact with him. I spoke to him two years later. We stayed low. Hmm. Uh, I spoke with him two years later and just kind of a follow-up. And I did a show to follow up after the Ohio Bigfoot attack. Oh, 58, uh, right? 58, I believe. Something like that. Okay, yeah. And this goes to show you how long and how important this event was and how long people will monitor you. After that show, I aired it again. I did not disclose his name. I did not disclose his specifics where he lived. I, I just wanted to know what's going on in his life and post it shortly after. Well, let me back up real quick. One of the things that was really major, aside from his marriage, his job, his home and all that, was that him and his wife's joint bank account was instantly closed. Their savings account, their checking account. In addition to that, wow. he had DHS call him and say, you owe back $30,000 in child support. I remember that, that they, they tried to. And he said, what? He goes, my daughter is 32 years old. She has, she's married with kids. I paid everything up to she was 18. And they said, no, we have it. You owe 30000 And so he was just like, all of a sudden, everything is coming on him. And the bank said, we don't know why your account's closed. They, the bank didn't even know. And so they couldn't pay any bills. They didn't have access to pay a water bill, get groceries, pay the mortgage. And so the wife is like going on like, what's going on here? She's hearing him, but not hearing him. Uh, and I don't blame her. It's not her fault. No. So what happened, she leaves him. And by the time the accounts open up, the bank says, well, it's an IRS thing. And this was six weeks later, all their money is gone out of the checking and all their money is gone out of savings. Gone. Poof. $6,000 in checking and I don't know how much he had in savings. That's ridiculous. It is, but that just goes to show you these people don't play by the rules. They don't care. Yeah. The powers the powers that be will do whatever it takes by any means necessary to silence you and keep you from you know, trying to expose you know, the truth. The truth. And they're... And so you wonder why would someone go to great lengths to do that? It's because these be they're not animals, they're beings. Mm -hmm. they're, they're creature beings that have that are self-aware. They're highly intelligent. They have a language, they have a culture. Mm -hmm. They have uh, an ability to be self-aware of their surroundings. They are self-aware of the mortality. They know that we can possibly hurt them. They know that a gun or a knife can injure them. And so the, this this is 
highly uh, important to our government. And that's why they want to keep it zip lip. Uh, but when I followed up again with him two years later, guess what happened again to him? His account got closed. Again, which we did not expect. Had I known that, I'd have never, I'd have never done that. But I thought, surely by now, two years, they still did it. And he called me back. So uh, we, uh, we, we helped him out. Uh, through our show, we helped him out because that was part of our reason why we we wanted to help people. Uh-huh. So uh, we stayed in contact with him, and uh, after that, we really didn't talk much about the what had happened. I kept it very generic, like "How you doing? Uh, yeah. How's your job? How how are you doing up here?" Yeah. And so I had been doing a lot more research and PTSD and uh, psychological type of uh, events or traumas uh, usually. And so we were just talking through therapy, like a talk therapy going through it and just being very generic about it as to not anything happen to him. So today he's doing better. Uh, I probably, in fact, he just called me this past week. And so we keep it very sweet to the point. Uh, he's, He's got a job. He's doing well. Things are moving for him, but the reason why that was such a unique encounter is because I feel that that particular encounter was probably that, that we're aware of that we know that was one of the biggest encounter stories, probably uh, who knows when um, of decades, maybe since Uh, the uh, film. Possibly. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty intense. It was. And see, I was, I'm careful to say uh, that we know of because how many of very similar type of events have happened already that you and I will never know. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's being covered up. And I mean, half the stuff oh, you see this missing 411, these people, um, the, the recent attacks in Tennessee in Cobb County, the lady was, you know, uh, what the lady was found. She wasn't dead, but she was found, you know, shoulder deep in this little Creek. And then the guy like week or two weeks before that, or maybe a month before that, he was found dead, and you know their 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 calves were ripped out. Their arms were, all the tendons and ligaments were ripped out, and they blamed it on you know local wild dogs. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and I tell our listeners, uh, you know, the people that kind of follow us, I just say, mm-hmm. listen, if something, even if you've never had an encounter, you have common sense. Mm-hmm. You know, I understand that not all sense is common, but everybody's got a certain level of common sense. If something doesn't smell right, look right, sound right, it's probably because it's not right. Um, you know, I always say if something's strange, you know, you always want to ask yourself, what could this be? What could this be? What else could this be? And and so if you've got a highway that's blocked off and you see military helicopters coming off and you go, I've never seen that before. You know, something, be thinking cryptid. Not everything that goes bump in the night is cryptid. Exactly. But when you know all of the normals of animal Mm -hmm. sound and uh, normal things and events that happen around you on a day-to-day basis, you have a level of reference. And so when something falls kind of an outlier or doesn't fall within that reference, then you can go, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. I know about this rabbit hole that goes deep. What else could this be? And so that's what I tell our listeners. You know, just allow a small percentage to, to soak in and be mindful of events like that. Have an open mind is the ba- the biggest thing to do is have an open mind because there are so many um, unopened minds that want to you know be part of these groups and you start posting evidence and pictures and they, they want to argue with people or they want to say it's not what, what, what the person that posted it that, you know, that specifically, specifically posted it in this group because they were worried that someone's going to ridicule them. But here comes someone with the ridicule. So I, I get what you're saying. And uh, someone was just saying, they, uh, I think it was Bettina Moss says she wishes you your, uh, still had your YouTube channel, Crypto Brothers Investigation. So you want to you talk about that a little bit? Because it's not yeah, off YouTube no, completely. That's a really good point. And I, I won't get too winded. Of course, we talked about this prior. Um, yeah, I, I've had, uh, that's a really good question. So thank you for asking. And I, I really appreciate the people that's missed us. And we've had some people upset, like I said, um, you know, when we got demonetized, it wasn't all, it wasn't about the money. It was small, but it was really helping pay for our gas. We were busy full time in our jobs with our family and everything. And it really helped uh, in, in that. And uh, 
when I got this show started, I promised my wife everything that I do outside of this, the, the show will fund it. We, you know, we're on it. We budget everything in the family like most families do. And so right, right. this would be budget. So long story short, I uh, found out somehow that we got demonetized because of the uh, song lyrics or something, which was not correct. I went through all the proper routes. We already and, talked about that. You know, me, me and you, and I think everybody in this chat that, that's listening knows why you got demonetized because you were putting some serious stuff out there and they didn't want it to happen. So they said, let's take his money. Let's take his money source away and see what that does. Yeah. And that's really, so it, it wasn't all about the money, but it sure helped because I was also, using those monies to donate to some of the people that, that was really, uh, as this, like the cousin, they got hurt. And that really kind of hurt because I, I was relying on that to help some of those people. So anyway, long story short, I created this, this, um, um, this patron membership, but here's what we're going to do. And I was talking about that. I'm going to dump uh, quite a few shows here within the next week on our YouTube channel. And I already thought about this before I was coming on, and I really want to do that. So we have about 115 shows. And so what I'm going to do on our private membership, I'm going to dump about, say, uh, somewhere around 40 all at once. And so we're going to do that on our, our YouTube channel. And because we really want to help people, we do. Uh, that was the whole goal of our channel is to help people, help them. You never forget but we can help them cope every day. So the biggest thing that I have learned more than anything with interviewing guests is that, yes, they saw something that was scary and it's very intriguing. It, it's in, it's enjoying to hear to a certain degree. But I'm careful about using the word enjoy. It, more importantly, it happened to another human being. Uh -huh. Real emotions. They, they have to go to work. They have a family and it affects them at every level of their life relationships, job, sleep, and it's traumatizing. So uh, you have to stay in contact. It's not a one and done with these interviews. It's the first interview that you should always follow up again and again and again, which takes work and effort. But but you're really, truly, if you're in it to help people, that's what you're going to be doing is you're going to be helping them. So instead of one and done, if you have a podcast show, you should really follow up with your guest, not because they had another encounter, but because you truly want to help them by sharing. They learn to cope a little bit easier every time, a little bit easier, a little bit easier. So you are truly, truly helping them. That's a good idea. That, that makes a lot of sense. Um, what I was going to say is you did the, the Patreon. Do you want to share that here? So if maybe somebody might want to sign up for it, because I think that's a great idea if to get back into um, catching up on some of your great episodes because you do. Yeah. I, mean, I, 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 I think I honestly, I think I watched every single one of them. Cause like I told you before, everything is redlined all the way to the end. So, yeah, it, it's, uh, I'll be, like I said, I'll be sharing. Um, okay. I, I don't, uh, they can go to the patron site. It's cryptid brothers investigations of Oklahoma. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to change. Uh, we have, there's three, seven and $10. We're going to, we're just going to go to one fee to make it easy. And, you know, I understand, you know, it, it's, if, if people want to join, that's fine. If they don't, that's okay. Cause I'm getting ready to put some shows on YouTube okay. so they can feel like, you know, they're kind of in the membership when they don't have to be. Exactly. So start getting our channel back. And we actually just filmed last night. That's why I couldn't. Uh, uh, oh yeah. That's right. Myself going here this morning. I'm not as young as I used to be, but we were out to 4 a.m. last night on an investigation out in Western Oklahoma. We were doing, uh, one thing we like to do is uh, active. We don't do live streaming, but we do active predator calling at night. Wally Dave and the crew. Yep. And he's, yep. He's, the ma he's the master caller, right? He's got, got yeah. all the good gear and devices. He's got the secret calls that he makes. Mm -hmm. He makes them and then he tunes them in. So he, he will make a call and then he'll tune it in to um, to get the right frequency. Yeah, the right frequency. He's got a good ear for that and he can hear. So a lot of the calls have double and triple frequencies going on at the same time. Oh, wow. And so we were calling last night and uh, we were in the back. At night we do what's called a, a – a, we do a tight group call. So we get in the back of the truck. Uh, I'm filming. I got a camera. Uh, we have protection, of course. And then Wiley's doing the calling and then my brother Bill and the other guys that can come with friends and, you know, with family, it's hard to get everybody together. But uh, so we're looking around and then Dave has a special way. He will shine that light to get eye reflection. 
So we never know what's coming in, but we're in areas that historically have had encounters. So right. basically we're ringing the dinner bell at night. Absolutely. So when do predators most often hunt and look night. at food? At night. Yeah. And, and so especially when you go from hot temperatures to cool temperatures or cold temperatures to really cold temperatures, that's when they start moving. They're looking for food. So, but uh, back to the patron. Yeah, people can go. It, it got overwhelming for a while. And, you know, we lost some patrons, of course, because it was you developed this monster. But um, if people want to go and, and look around and peruse, that's great. If they don't sign up, that's fine. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you a lot of shows anyway for free on YouTube. And we're just, I'm just happy to share them. Um, so we do have some people that's followed us that are patrons from the very beginning. And I really, really appreciate those people. A lot of their support has helped a lot of people like this cousin in Ohio. Right. I'm in the process um, that support also. I'm in the process of writing a book. Nice. And it is a field guide that I felt uh, actually came the first time from the first time I was talking to the cousin. It just hit me that I need a guide to help him and to help those that seen for the first time and to help them follow what did I see? What did what what do I do? Who do I go with? all those things. And so it's a field guide that gives them the answers just point blank. And it's, uh, it, uh, and so I've been working on it about a year now. That's a good thing to do because I mean, e even people that don't have encounters, if they read that, they can kind of take, take heed of what to expect and, and kind of what uh, can come out of it and how to kind of do it safely. So you don't want to have been, you know, either in a hospital or, or worse in the morgue. So that's, that's a good thing to do. Well, knowledge is key, like we were talking about, you know, and it's it's one of those things where, unfortunately, a person has to have an experience or have something happen very strange for them to set them on this quest, this uh, this journey of like, I know that was no man. What, what did I hear? What did I see? So then they would probably, uh, I felt that there was there needed to be a need for a book that they could grab, that they can give them A to Z. This is... This is possibly what I saw and what you heard. Uh, this is why. And then a lot of those that I'm writing about this experience comes from the hundreds of interviews that I've done, the hours and hours of investigation that we've done in and out of state, and just kind of what I call wood savvy knowledge of the woods. Yeah. What makes sense? You know, uh, I, I don't get any weird premonitions or anything thing like that it's just what makes sense in the woods how do animals typically yeah. behave that they're indigenous to their state exactly and, not only that and it's also being aware of your surroundings too like know what's around you you know if you got say there, there's a drop off or there's a creek or like a you know uh what they call those the little zigzags there's a name for the zigzags i can't think of a name um well when, uh, it, well, when creeks crossover. Land, you're like, yeah, the crossovers yeah yeah it, it's just being aware you know we're living in the city has numbed our senses. Mm -hmm. And so if you really want to get that back and you want to investigate, which, you know, you can still have a, an enjoyable, pleasurable experience being in the woods. But what I would do is work your way up to getting some of that sensory information back. Listen to sounds, you know, look at our eyes typically look toward light areas where light hits a tree or the ground. But what you have to do is start getting your eyes used to looking in dark areas. Uh -huh. Kind of hard to do. You're, you're naturally go to light. That's the way our eyes are designed. So if you start looking in dark areas, you'll see more typically. And so use all your senses, the hearing. Uh -huh. know, you know, when you hear crows off in the distance, crows are a bird that when they get agitated because they don't like something, they start crowing. And so they can be a natural alarm for you. Uh -huh. So uh, spend some time in the woods and you'll have, you'll be safer. And I believe too, as well as all the guys, protect yourself. Don't just carry a camera no. uh, because there's too many other wild hogs, wild feral dogs in the woods that can really hurt you and kill yeah. you. Big so, dogs. Don't carry a camera and be blind. Or, I mean, I, I'm exaggerating here, but I've seen that sometimes, and that's really not smart. You know, think about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I, I know. Don't, 
you don't need to hold a gun by no means. I'm just saying either conceal it, wear it safely, get some safety measures, get some, you know, take some training. Uh, and if you don't want to do that, at least have some type of other form of yep. bear spray whistle, super light, uh, you know, thousand thousand uh, lumen flashlight, you know, 120 uh, decibel Warm. low whistle, flash bangs, you name it, you know, all that stuff. That's what uh, my friend Nick Valente from the NADP, he, he swears by, you know, safety precautions because, you know, New York State's very uh, gun liberal. So he has to resort to the, the you know, other devices to protect himself when he's out on investigations, like the flashbangs, the whistles, you know, machetes, um, you know, thousand, twelve hundred lumen flashlights, you know, whistle, all that. So bear spray, you know, all that is, is a good defense. Uh, blow horns. Blow horns. Yeah, blow horns. Great. Uh, and and uh, you can get some loud ones, and that is a startle factor. And uh, I mean that that uh, I had a truck driver one time that was approached very closely on the outside of his cab of his truck, and he used the semi truck blow horn yep. and it startled the Bigfoot and he did it three times. And finally the Bigfoot in a very aggressive posture just walked away. Yeah. So uh, it's, you know, that's what we can learn from these interviews is by listening to the interviews, you can, you can learn quite a bit. Uh, so just put that those, you know, so when we listen to these interviews, you can always learn just a little here, a little there, a little here, a little there. So if, if you ever have an encounter, You'll know, I remember, you can kind of slow down a little bit and, and think a little calmly if you can. Just take a deep breath and you can either back out of the situation or you know kind of what to do. Uh, the key is don't run. You know, you never out. run. Anything like that is the predator because you know what runs? Food runs. So when you run, you're food. You're on the menu. That's a good way. That's that's well said right there. You, you just collect your thoughts. But – be mindful of that inner spirit or that sense. If it says you need to leave, then by all means leave, but try to do it as calmly as you can. Okay. Uh, try not to run because uh, you're right. Uh, predators especially are provoked by running. Yeah. Uh, so Look you dogs, you run from a dog. What's what's a dog going to do? It's going to chase you. Chase you down, and you're not going to. Nope. You're not going to beat the dog. Nope. Just it. So, um, yeah, I mean, I got off sidetracked here, but no, no, that's, it's a great conversation. I mean, cause people need to know, you know, they say you have to know to protect yourself. God forbid something happens. I mean, people go in the woods all the time. You got all these hiking trails all over these national parks and you hear a lot of, you know, every now and then you hear a bad situation happen. Well, the best thing to do is keep people from having these bad situations or, you know, slash bear attack, dog attack, which they call, you know, on the news or the papers. So. Exactly. And that is, you know, it, it, that's the part that we wanted to fill in with Wiley, Dave and the guys is that we had a lot of people ask us about firearms and things because they know we carry. Uh, we're very respectful of how we carry. We just don't brandish firearm in the woods uh, like, a, you know, you know, I had one guy just, you know, was, you know, we're since we're in Oklahoma, he said, well, you guys are carrying firearms like a bunch of hicks. And I said, well, you know, to each their own in their opinion, but we really don't do that. Uh, we're very respectful. We, 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 we use, we're huge on safety. We practice. So, and we just don't brandish firearms. We're actually, I can seal mine. Uh -huh. I used to have that 500 Smith and Wesson that you saw in the Alaska triangle. Yeah. But I really, and most of the time I don't carry that. First of all, it's really heavy <laughs> and oh. it, it really gets in the way a lot. I do carry a 45, 1900, okay. uh, that's sidearm, but I, I, you can feel it. So my hands are free. And by the way, if people really want to have an encounter, which I, I hate to say it that way, I'm not advocating that by no means. But if you were going to increase the likelihood of having an encounter, have your hands free. Uh -huh. Don't have anything exposed that says, I'm hunting you. I'm looking for you. No. Use normal voices. Don't put on any camo. And guess what? you'll probably have a higher likelihood. Now, with that being said, I'm all about safety. Do I trust these creatures? No, no, but I'm just saying over my experience and over talking to some seasoned investigators, that was their recommendation. And now after a lot of these interviews, I agree. They're probably right on track. Uh, 
that's so you know, uh, they know you're in the woods before you even get in the woods. I was just gonna say they, they can feel you. They can they can sense your frequency. We you know you're probably half a mile to a mile. They know they got these sentries, the watchers. They got everyone. They're gonna know you're in the woods before you even get close to the woods. So they know how to counteract on that. You know, it's, it's a huge chess game, and they know they're the kings of the forest. So it is. Yeah, what it is. we cannot outmaneuver them. You might get I me. Mean, we get lucky every once in a while, and I say luck uh, to to stumble upon them without yeah. them knowing either the wind is right, uh, the sound is right or oh, whatever. Uh, and some people will walk up behind one that's bent over looking for grubs or something. And that's happened many times, but, uh, for the most part, you're, you're not going to surprise them. No, no. I've even heard of one, uh, from, if you remember from Kumbo and bear, bear was talking about walking up on one that was, uh, kind of had his pants down, you know, unexpectedly doing, doing his business in the woods. And, uh, oh, he wasn't really? too far from it, you know. Once the thing caught on, he kind of got up real quick and got got out of dodge because he he was spotted. And those things, you know, they're not trying to have human contact. So yeah, it was pretty wild. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me. It doesn't surprise me. So, uh, you know, hunters have surprised. I would say if there's a group of people that surprised <clears throat> these uh, Bigfoot or even Dogman more than not would be hunters, just because we're more aware of wind scent camouflage uh you know you know we're still not at our best compared to them but uh we have a little bit more advantage than the average citizen so uh you know being that we get up in trees to hunt deer and a lot of hunters will they'll have uh, i had a buddy one time that was in a deer stand and on private property and about he got up there about 4 a.m and about 4 30 he saw a figure walking through the woods at a fast pace no light dark and there was so much hmm. undergrowth and thorns. He was wondering how this man got from here to here. He was really high in the tree, walked through without missing a beat. As light came about 11 o'clock, he got out of the tree for lunch. And he looked at the same path where this man walked. And he said, I don't get it. How did he walk through six foot of briars, not missing a beat without a light? Uh -huh. And, and I said, well, it probably wasn't a man. Nope. It, it walked fast, so I might agree with you, Lance. Yeah, I had a, I had a very similar uh, encounter like that on my property in, in North Carolina. In the woods behind my house I hunt, I had a homemade tree stand, and uh, it was around 4, 4.30 when I got up in it. And you know how the woods are, pitch black. You don't see anything. And unfortunately, I dropped my flashlight climbing into the stand. And uh, when this thing happened, I heard something go off to my – between nine and between seven and ten o'clock, about twenty to thirty yards from me, and then the other thing going off was at my between twelve and one o'clock. That was about another thirty yards, and it sounded like monkey hooting, not owl, but it sounded like monkey, like whoa, whoa, back and forth. And then then you heard it even louder, and then you heard the clicking noise that they were the, the yeah. clicking noise that they were doing. And uh, I couldn't move. I was I was frozen. I, I was like, I, you, when, when you have that fight or flight, well, I couldn't move. I was just, I, I was so, my heart felt like it was going to pop out of its chest. And when that happened, I actually dropped my cell phone off the tree stand. And uh, I didn't know what to do. I, I, I had no, you know, no clue what, how this was going to go down. So after about 30 seconds, I got up and I was like, you know, I don't want no problems. I'm here to hunt deer. I don't want to bother you. I'll just let me get my deer. I'll leave you alone. You know, I don't want no issues. I'm not trying to disturb you, whatever you're doing. About a minute or two goes by, everything gets quiet. You know, this forest comes back to life. Um, about another 35, 40 minutes, you know, the, the light comes through the forest. You know, right before the sun comes up, you know, the, you know how the forest starts to light up in the morning. Well, that's what happened. And about another hour tops, um, I got out of the tree stand. I went home, and I shit you not, I didn't go in the woods for about six months after that time. And this is about almost five years ago when it happened on my property. So I was traumatized by it. You know, I had PTSD, absolutely. And I didn't know who to talk to. So when, when, when I started finding these kind of groups that came out, I started getting involved with them. And um, I talked to Wes Germer on his, on his uh, website, his, his uh, Sasquatch Chronicles, told him about it. And it was very comforting just to have somebody to talk to, to understand, you know, just to just to take it in what you're what you're giving them because you know when you hold this stuff in it really it's not good for you. No, and, and you touched on a good, a really important topic here, and that is that uh, 
you know, a lot of people will say, how do you guys go out at night? How do you do this? You guys must be, you know, just, you know, pardon me, you know, badasses. And I said, it has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with how big of a man or how big of a woman or how, how uh, uh, unafraid you are. We're more fascinated about the subject matter and about learning what's going on. But we have firearms, so that makes us feel somewhat secure. Do I feel 100%? Not really, but we're in a group, so it's better than single. Exactly. So- uh, you're, you know, we can say what we're, we, we rehearsed a lot. If this happens, this is what we're going to do. Right guys. You know, so we go through and I verbally get, uh, I'll ask the guys, this is what we're going to do. Right. You know, so I want to know that I can depend on them. And, and so we've been shooting together a long time. We know each other. We've been in the woods a lot. So, uh, it, that's an important part though. I mean, it doesn't matter how big of a person you are, uh, when the event happens, it's your natural instinct is to be afraid. I mean, you, because now you know that there's more than you in the woods. And then when something happens and you, you understand a click or a sound, a sound like a hoot owl, a bad hoot owl sound or a coyote sound. uh, Or in many cases, uh, one guy I was interviewing, he kept seeing, uh, he thought was a deer hind end. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the woods on his property for a number of years. And he was like, he put a scope up and he's like, that's the weirdest deer hind end I've seen. Well, long story short, he was looking at a Bigfoot that was playing picky boo. He didn't look on the other side. Oh, wow. He was looking at the back end of this round butt. Mm-hmm. And, and so he didn't dawn on him to look up about six feet higher on the right side yeah. of the tree. And then uh, he did one day and it freaked him out. So uh, it's just one of those things where when you do this and you go out, it's natural to be afraid. It's natural. Just shows help calm. I hope a little bit. It's hard to say on any circumstance what's going to happen, but if you can rehearse, Uh you like to go in the woods. When I go, I'm preparing that if I do see, what am I going to do? Where where is my quickest route to get to safety? Uh, if, if I'm bow hunting, what am I going to do? Versus if I'm rifle hunting, what am I going to do? If I'm just hiking for the day, what I'm going to do? Uh, did I tell somebody where I'm going to go? Do I always have a backpack on? So it's just planning. You don't have to be paranoid. You just have to be aware and prepared. We got a question for you. You see yes. any the captions underneath? Uh, has Lance seen a dog man yet? Yes. Uh, we were out in Western Oklahoma. Uh, we went back to where Wiley Dave had his encounter some time ago. And of course the way it typically is when you go out and you want to see something, what's typical, you don't see something. You don't see nothing. Right. And that happens 99% of the time. At least it does to us. So we were out on this one, this was in the winter time a couple of years ago. And we went in a rough, it was close to the location where Wiley saw his dog man encounter. And except this dog man was more of a, a coyote color, a calico right. color. Wow. And it was me, Dave, and I think at the time my brother Lane was with us. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was, it wasn't a close encounter, not as close. It wasn't uh, Wiley Dave's encounter. The, the dog man was about 400 yards out on this little knoll of this river, dried riverbed, and then it stood up. This one was off in the tree line, but it was pacing. Mm-hmm. And I put the scope on it, and it was the biggest canine I've ever seen in my life. I mean, I was, uh, I did not record that session, honestly, because I didn't think we, it wasn't a, planned ordeal it was a quick well, when you had that quick experience you're not planning on, on filming it because it happened so fast it's like you don't even have time to think well, about grabbing your is it record it was, because you're just it was supposed to be a coyote hunt that's yeah. what it was and so it was a last minute hey let's go coyote hunting and then wally goes let's go back over there and i said okay so i grabbed my gopro and i just throw it in i wasn't thinking filming it was just one of those things but of course when you least expect it it happens And then I was out there. We're all grouped up. We're not separate. And I saw something on the wood line that was moving. I thought, that's it. Is that a horse? And I'm looking. And then I put a scope up to it. And I told Wiley, I said, Wiley, 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 
we got something at the woods that that's a canine he said hold steady don't move and he said i'm not going to call anymore because he'd been calling right he was doing the calls yeah and i said do not call anymore don't call anymore right here and then i realized i don't have my gopro with me so it was just an experience that happened for a moment it paced and i saw maybe three times one two three and it went into the wood line whether it caught our smell i don't know but it was it part so of it was a quick chance quick chance encounter that kind of just happened where you know it was probably coming because because dave was doing the calls he came out and he probably noticed you guys and he was like i'm out of here you know yeah and and the one that dave saw it probably caught its his smell but what was strange and everybody can listen to that one uh with dave is that i think it caught dave's smell but it came in on four legs but ran away on two two yeah i remember that and that thing the tracks were huge weren't didn't, didn't dave go back and measure the tracks the paw print and it was probably we went, like triple yeah, we went yes so when he got out of the truck when he was going to go on his stand that before he saw that dog man he was walking he parked at a uh, battery tank he backed in and as he was walking in the in this pump jack road right in the center you know there's grass and sometimes there'll be a gopher mound right. sometimes you know and so there was a big print right in the middle of that gopher mound like it was left intentional and he thought some guys were playing a joke on it because it was like big as five plate. it was huge it was just a massive canine with uh digits two three four and that metatarsal pad right. and it was like looking around he, he thought instantly like someone's someone's jacking with me mm. and so when he saw that creature he he said that was the first time in like 40 years of hunting he was afraid he backed out of there with his gun he backed out and he left his gun loaded in the cab which is not day because you're not supposed to have a loaded firearm driving around but he backed out of there and he said i i couldn't wait to hit the blacktop wow that's insane yeah well, I think we're going to do a little bit of the Alaska Triangle as I kind of wrap it up on that. So if okay. you want to go into that, I know if I, I don't know if many people have, have watched it, but you did a special on the travel channel about the Alaska Triangle. And it's kind of like an area in Alaska. It's like, a, you know, they base it on a triangle because people go missing there. And it's just strange things happen. Portals, mountain giants, Bigfoot, you name I mean, these giant Bigfoot, you name it. So if you want to do a little, just a little brief, uh, you know, recap on what you've done out there and how, you know, how it came to be. I'd love to hear some about it. And I'm sure everybody else would too. Yeah. Uh, well, season two is supposed to come out next month. Oh, believe wow. it. Is. Uh, it was, you know, COVID put everything behind months and months. Yeah. And so it was supposed to come out in January of this past year, but because of close contact and all that and all the editing that took place it's going to come out i think i've been told this september uh and we actually my part of season two we filmed here in oklahoma in fact we oh, filmed wow. right on right on my property uh so uh season one so i got invited uh, uh by this uh film company to um, go out to Alaska. They kind of interviewed me a little bit of some of the stuff that uh, why I was into this and what got us into this. And they found us on YouTube and really nice guys. And so we went out to Alaska, Alaska, which I didn't know prior to this show. You know, uh, I love Alaska. I, I've been, uh, I've not been before, but I had friends that been and uh, friends that hunt and people that just go out and recreate and they go there. But uh, Alaska, there's a Alaska Triangle that's very similar to the tropical, uh, the Bermuda Triangle, okay. it's, and it runs. Um, let's see here. I want to say it runs from uh, Juneau to Anchorage, from Anchorage to Burrow, and back down. Right. Yeah, and I know Anchorage is a part of it, so I remember that. And so it's about 216,000 square miles of amazing, beautiful, rugged very dangerous frozen terrain mm -hmm. and since about 1982 84 mm -hmm. over 16,000 people have gone missing including locals people in airplanes snowmobiles hikers yeah. hunters kayakers fishermen you name it yeah, you name it adventurers gold gold you know people panning for gold they just disappear and so 
that and also with that being said, there has been uh, flyover pilots that have seen very interesting structures, pyramids, holes over these very remote areas that shouldn't be there. And Pyramid. so pyramids, yes. Wow. Yes. Wow. And um, so my part in the Alaska Triangle, what they wanted from me is to talk about some of the uh, uh some of the indigenous tribes there that have been there for who knows how long in Alaska and some of their beliefs regarding the Thunderbirds, the little people, the Kushtaka or mm -hmm. the Kushtaka, which is very similar to our Bigfoot. It just translates literally to Otter Man. Uh, so I was there. Uh, we did some investigation. Of course, it's not like the investigation that we typically do because this is on film. Um, but uh, they wanted me to get very similar how I would look at stuff, how would I would conduct investigation. But usually I go with guys. And I'm not by myself. Yeah. And so it was a real pleasure to go out and kind of show them some of the stuff that we do, how we do it. And they were up for it. Uh, I thought it, it's amazing how anything could be in Alaska because there's numerous game. There's numerous uh, beautiful waters with, uh, fish, all kinds of uh, amphibian life, you, you name it. So anything in Alaska, you know, is there's an opportunity for anything. They got those wild salmon streams too out there. I mean, you get salmon that are, you know, three to five foot long in, in those in those spawning areas and, and out in the seclusion. Oh, so. It's it's absolutely gorgeous, but it's also very dangerous. Uh -huh. uh, there's, uh, you know, in Oklahoma, we have poison ivy, we have. Uh, thorns and things like that but out there uh when i was filming i was grabbing a hold of some uh, uh bushes there the night was falling and i grabbed a hold of something called a devil's devil's claw or devil's thorn plant and it has it's completely loaded with thorns about an inch long and i got a handful of that real quick and uh, realized that that's not what i needed to grab and no. so, uh, but it, it is uh, it is so beautiful there but uh, there's a lot, I've done a few invest, uh, excuse me, uh, interviews, of people, Alaskans that have seen massive Bigfoots out there. Uh, and, and so, and they've seen rock climbing Bigfoots, uh, uh bounding on these boulders on the side of mountains. Oh, wow. So, uh, people that, uh, locals that go blueberry picking, uh, and they'll look up on the mountains and, uh, they'll see a Bigfoot just literally traversing long on these boulders. And so, uh, so anyway, it, it was one of those rare opportunities. I really enjoyed. I had a good time. I wish I could have stayed longer out there, but uh, uh, again, season two that I've been told is coming September. Uh, if it's delayed, it's probably going to be October, but no later than that. I've heard. I'm looking forward to that because I, I really enjoyed the first one. Now, do you remember that whaling town in Alaska that where all the residents disappeared? Is that part of the the, the trunk? Because I remember, I mean, that's like a known histor historical um, event that happened, like that that old whaling town. I can't think of the name of it, but it's like everybody just disappeared from it. it it's just it's crazy, yes. and it's supposed to be haunted as well. Yes, the name escapes me. Port. Yeah, port. Um, I should have heard it down. Port Walsh or something? Port Way? No, it's not Port Walsh. Port Chatham. Port Chatham. Yep, that's it. Port Chatham. Port Chatham. So, um, yeah, the, the story with that, which was fascinating, because they asked me if, if I get to go again, if, if the series continues, where would I like to go? And that was one place I wanted to go, because awesome. the reason why that was fascinating for me that I learned while I was there is that what ran the people out of that town was a group of hairy men. Yeah, the hairy men. That ran them. They were relentless uh, daily and weekly. And finally, the people said, I'm done. Yeah. Let's get out. And so that was the premise of why this town just became a ghost town overnight. And uh, so that that's kind of a – and that area is kind of an – of course, most of these towns in Alaska are isolated. Uh, but uh, this is – one of those towns, you know, it's just kind of isolated. It was a small town to begin with, a mining town, a fishing town. Uh, and then overnight, it just it just kind of died out. Poor Chatham, yeah. I'm just wondering if, you know, maybe because it was like a whale and slash fishing area where they were, you know, bringing all this whale lard in and whales and fish, 
maybe that was kind of you know drawing in drawing them in because it was food well you can't uh, that's very logical i mean because how many interviews uh have you done i done and wes done and other podcasters that uh food you know like anything you have to survive on sustenance and you know when i tell people that have encounters uh, they have uh some creature or a being coming on their property one of the things that i recommend aside from raising up the canopies on their trees so they can see clearing brush away from the home having uh you know, non-lethal means to keep these beings at bay, oh. like a solar lights, motion activated solar light. One of the things I say is remove the food, the garbage away from your home. Yeah. And so, part of that really maybe the chicken pen. They got chickens, you mm -hmm. know, because that's like a smorgasbord, you know. Exactly. So uh you know, I you know it's just one of those things where, you know, one is close. They're going to get a little bit closer. Exactly. They're opportunity feeders, so they're going to get, go for the easiest opportunity for a free meal. So it says these restaurants now, they're throwing all kinds of food out in their dumpsters next to the woods. Well, guess what's going to go in that dumpster? If you got bear in the area, bear are going to go. If you got coyote, fox, or anything else, they're going to go get that food. And if you got Bigfoot, Bigfoot is going to go get himself, you know, get in that dumpster. And there was, it wasn't too long ago, there was an encounter with the dumpster where a uh, the sheriff uh, guy was he wasn't with the um department of wildlife but he was, his friend was and he was like a tag along and they actually went and blinded this bigfoot next to a dumpster and shot it and killed it and he had to you know they took this guy's rifle and you know luckily he he said uh when they came to his house to take the rifle he said it was his ex-girlfriend's rifle and it wasn't his rifle that he used that night so he's like yeah whatever i didn't care it was like a little 22 or something well you know that's a good point is, is that there have been, you know, you'll get discussions. There's lots of interesting discussions on some of these chat lines is that, you know, shoot, don't shoot. Uh, right. Can they be killed or not killed? And especially that uh, kind of conversation revolves around these dogman creatures. And the, and the thing of it is, here's the thing. Uh, and, and, you know, the, there's lots of discussions. Where did it come from? Did it come from a portal? Was it dropped from, you know, extra? Sure. It, it goes on and on and on. And, and what I like to say and so that I can understand it and keep it within a realm of what Lance understands and what Wiley is that if, if, if what we're seeing is physical and it, it's, it poops in the woods, it eats, it drinks, it sleeps based on some of the evidence that we've seen, then it can be killed. I mean, logically speaking, it, it can be now what can kill it can be, uh, you know, various uh, means to do that. It doesn't have to be a firearm necessarily. No. That's what we go to logically. And so uh, it doesn't have to be a big firearm like I carry it all. Uh, it has to be well placed. Uh, and I remember I had a show with the Florida woman, the Florida mother that kills a Bigfoot. Uh -huh. A lot of people were up and, you know, they were upset the because yeah. they said, well, no, the, you know, a lady can't use a pistol to kill the bigfoot i'm saying well here's the thing what we don't know about that mother is did she belong to some type of a, um, a firearms uh group? Exactly. how well did she know that firearm probably pretty well or she wouldn't be packing the firearm and if she so a, well i'm more afraid of a person that has a small caliber firearm that uses it all the time rather than a person that has a big firearm and doesn't use it at all because I bet you she had placement very well with that. If it was a nine millimeter or whatever it was, and could she put a big foot down? Absolutely. Unequivocally, she could. And so uh, that story was legitimate. Uh, I had it uh, corroborated with another person I got to speak to later, but she asked that I not ever, ever, ever post her story, uh -huh. which was the neighbor. So uh, all I had was the one gentleman that uh, lived in that neighborhood. But right. so a firearm, smaller caliber. Now, and I don't mean a pea shooter like a 22, but I'm saying something like a 9 millimeter, 45, uh, can do some harm uh, when it's well placed. So this is why you want to practice, because when you're under stress like you were that day that you had those vocalizations and that, that day all i had on me was a 380 with hollow points and i wasn't trying to use it because i knew i knew from the sound and, and i the vibration i felt from all that and i can I mean i could feel it in my chest 
I knew that that 380 was going to do jack shit, especially considering it was pitch black and I couldn't even see the, the thing that where I couldn't see where to get a shot at if I needed to because I could shoot right with it. But what are you going to shoot at? Pitch black. There's nothing there. So unless they're well, right on top of you, you got no choices. And that's just it. You know, a, 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 a marksman, a person that is professional about carrying a firearm knows not to just point and shoot in the dark. You will never do that. Yeah. You have to have clear visualization of that bullet. Where's it going? And where's it going to go? If you miss. So yeah. that's the thing you should never, if you don't know where it's going to go, do not shoot. Uh, and you know, not everything that goes bump in the woods is a cryptid. And yeah. so you just have to be really mindful of that. And I carry a firearm, but it is our last resort. And exactly. Know. It's your last resort. Like your life depends on it. Cause my, my, my main objective is not to go bag one of these cryptids. That's not never in my intention, but when my life is on the line and it's, it's, it's uh, do or die or like, you know, kill or be killed. You better believe I'm going to be using everything I have resource. I have to defend myself, to stay alive. And last but not least, I'll say, make sure I'll have one, one shot for myself. Cause I'll you know, say, like everyone says, I'm not going to let this thing tear me to shreds and do what they want with me. I'm going to do myself in before I let that thing take me out. Right. I mean, and I think just, you know, I, if it came down to it, one of the non-lethal ways that you could stop an engagement, if, if one was starting to get a little froggy on you or aggressive, is you could, like, I, I keep mine concealed now, that I would just slowly open it up where they could see mm -hmm. yes, and they, then, know, they know what they are they know what they are you don't have to say a uh, gun you know they can see it they're very observant they are highly intelligent beings they're well aware of our capabilities mm -hmm. they are like you said the watchmen they watch us they were their entertainment but they're smart about it too that's why they keep their distance so i think just having it concealed for me it works for me um uh, uh, Wiley, he, he 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 goes out and he's ready for. He's uh, Wiley runs out with a you know uh, Bushmaster five hundred, you know, with a 50, 50 round drum magazine, and he's ready with his night vision scope, and he's ready to whatever. Wiley in the dark, I guarantee you. I mean, no. you're you're in for uh, uh, you you gotta. We're always at, you know we're at night. We know where everybody's at. We don't stay too far away. Uh, we're whispering. We do have earphones on that amplify the sound and we also can talk to each other and we can whisper and we can hear uh, yeah. because when your predator calling predators are great listeners they can smell like no tomorrow and they can see really well uh, a lot better than you and i at night especially oh, yeah. because where they hunt night. Right? so we're at a disadvantage actually but the key is you just you don't move a lot and you whisper and you try to have the wind in your favor um and, and so that's what we use. And so we filmed one last night. <clears throat> I think we had like seven coyotes come in all at once. And we're trying to do something different that people can actually see that these calls work and that uh, calling at night, it's, it's a little dangerous, but with a group that we know what to look for, right, right. you know, so we're not like walking around. Oh yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean because I've done coyote uh, hunting at night with my brother in New Jersey before. You know, all this night vision and infrared came out to the public, so we would just be like a flashlight and sit all against a log and do the old wounded rabbit calls, and uh, they work. So I, I know what you mean, and you just got to stay still and stay stay calm and collective, and wait for something to come in on you. Yeah, and also at night you don't want to go out in the summer because uh, you still have uh, you know rattlesnakes that are trying to uh, warm up mm -hmm. on the stand. You don't want to step and break your ankle. There's some uh, no. uh, fairly wooly places to hurt yourself at night, get a stick in your eye. So this is the best way that we do it at night. Mm -hmm. uh, now we have camped in areas that are more open uh, at night. We did one just outside of where I live here, about 15 miles. We camped at night and. That was an interesting night because what we found was we did not have any cryptids come up, but what we indirectly found using an EMF reader, mm -hmm. we accidentally stumbled and we verified this with the landowner. He didn't tell us. We stumbled on a burial ground, uh, an Indian oh, wow. burial by indirectly. The EMF reader was going off like the high level and it beeps when it hits red. Beep. 
and it was going off and my brother bill said lance i think this thing is broke and so or we have a creature creature close by so we were in the wide open i looked around i was talking on the open hey we don't mean you any harm and so i just got this feeling i'm gonna try something and i told the guys i said give me the mf reader and all of a sudden i said if someone is here with us um we mean you no harm we come on behalf of peace and i just said we come in the name of the lord um are you male or female and i said um just talk as loud as you can. And I said, if you're male, uh, you can step forward and we'll make this go off. If you're female, step forward. And it went off. And uh, I asked about 20 questions and I got 20 answers. Oh, I, had, wow. I went home. Uh, the EMF reader was going off all night around our camp. I told the landowner the next day and he says, oh my gosh, Lance, I should have told you. And I go, told me what? He said, I should have told you about what my sons found down there, that you were only camped. You were only 150 feet away. And I said, what's that? He said, there is a burial ground down there. We don't know how old it is, but my sons found something down there that freaked them out. Sounds like Skimwalker Ranch all over again out in Oklahoma. Well, what we found digging up some history, and I know this doesn't, but here's why it relates to the cryptid. Oh. I asked something that I've never seen on a show. I asked this spirit. I asked, I said, thank you for responding. Again, we come in peace with you no harm. Of course, my brother Lane was freaking out by this time. Oh, he, was, he was by the fire. He says, Lance, I don't want anything to do with what you're doing. I said, I'm not inviting anything. I'm just asking a question. And I said, we are he actually here investigating a creature called or a being called a Bigfoot or Sasquatch. It's a hairy man, a large hairy type of being. Are you familiar with this? If so, please make my EMF reader go off. It went beep. And then I got an audible. I went home later and it said, yes. I said, how do you view these creatures? Do you view, the, view them as a protector, a friend, or how do you see them? And what I heard on my audio and I had to listen five to six times. And this is what they said. Demons. That's what I heard. That's and crazy. I had to listen to that. And then I let my brother Bill and Lane listen. And they just about lost it. That's um, insane. I told the landowner and he said, Lance, it doesn't surprise me. Because um, he's had some property damage. of chick He had uh, bullpen fences completely Bullpen fences are extremely tough gauge. I mean, incredible. I, there's one that's been up like a banana peel. And uh, I, they gave it to me because I asked it. I said, this is, this is what happened? They said, yeah, it was bent all the way to the ground. It was bent over like this to the ground. And um, so anyway, that area is like a mini Skinwalker Ranch down there. Uh, it, it's it's crazy, but uh, I actually have gone down there bef uh, by myself, uh, and I went and asked some more questions, and I got a reply every time I asked. Wow. So anyway, that kind of deviates a little bit, but still on track with the with the cryptid sense. Oh, uh, I, I thought it was fascinating. And the That's land definitely owner, fascinating. And you got free reign to the land anytime you want, so you can go there anytime you want and do investigations. So that's oh, good. Yeah. And, and, you know, along those lines, the people, sorry, I got the train going. That's all right. Uh, I'll just speak louder. Uh, a lot of people ask me, Lance, where can I go investigate? Where can I go? And, you know, the most logical, straightforward answer is sometimes you can go literally in your backyard. You would be surprised. And my brothers and I always say this. People would be absolutely stunned and surprised that what's roaming around at night in your alleyways Mm -hmm. on the perimeters of suburbs uh, yeah. on your property at night, you would absolutely be shocked. So sometimes be a little snoopy on your property, walk the fence lines, look at trails, look at hair. Is there hair snagged in a barbed wire fence? Look high in trees. Um, I had one guy, I, he called me and he said, I didn't have an encounter, but I got a goat skeleton up in my tree 40 feet is that anything so i mean it could be a predator it could be a mountain lion i yeah. said yes. but 
it could be something else too. Mm-hmm. We don't know. We'd have to investigate further. So sometimes look in the immediate vicinity of where you're at. You might find more than what you think. Exactly. I mean, I know my woods have a lot of activity in my property and, uh, you know, I go out there humble. I, I don't go out there you know, with an antagonistic mind. I just go out there with a happy, humble heart. And I just say, you know, I come in peace and I'm here to walk the woods and, Ever since, you know, I've been doing that, you know, I, I don't get bothered. I, I get, you know, treat. I know that these things have a respect for me now, or at least an understanding to kind of, I'm, I'm like the neighbor. Now. I'm like the crazy neighbor with no hair. So it's like, yeah, the crazy neighbor's coming out. So I'll, I'll, let them let walk around, you know, don't bother them. So it is what it is. And that's what I tell people. I've got some guys that they know they've got some creatures on their property and they just say, what should I do? I said, act normal, mm-hmm. be normal, act normal. Uh, do what you normally do uh, and, and until something weird, till you get a feeling that you should be worried. Okay. I said, you'll know what that feeling is. Otherwise, just cut your wood, plow your gardens, do whatever you do. Okay. But if you have, we know these creatures have an affinity toward kid laughter and kids playing. Okay. Kids, kids, uh, whether it's kids, even like females out playing like in the yard or like whether it's kids, young kids, or just females in general that draws them in more. So you're, you're right. Go ahead. So I, I told uh, this gentleman, I said, when you have your grandkids over, have them wear a brightly colored shirt. Keep on them like glue. Never turn your back. Okay. Don't have any shrubs really close to the house where they can play hide and seek out, okay. you know. Uh, do it with an eye shot and always stay outside and have them wear brightly cl- uh, colored shirts and, uh, you know, don't have them wander too far and sandwich them in between adults. If you're on a little hike or you're going to go fishing or something, don't let them go up ahead, run up, or don't let them straggle behind. Keep them in between you. Absolutely. That's great advice. Well, I was just going to thank you again and, 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 you know, appreciate that you came on tonight and I see it's getting dark by you and you're losing light. So I don't yeah. want to keep you anymore. And I, I told you about an hour, hour, we're actually, I think an hour and 16 minutes. So I really do appreciate you Lance and thank you for coming on. And it was a thank pleasure. You, and uh, maybe we could do this again, you know, after, uh, after your, your um, season starts, maybe we can get to like a, Q&A as well because I, I want to do a Q&A but I, it's getting too dark for you and I don't want to take too much of your time because you gave me a, your, I appreciate you giving me your time and I don't want to take any more. It's Sunday night. Everyone's got work tomorrow so I appreciate you coming on. You're very welcome. It was a pleasure, Tom. And uh, yeah, I'd love to come back on and if someone I know, I kept seeing some uh, folks coming up here popping up with some Q&A so I'll be more than happy uh, to to answer what I can. I, I I, like many of us, we're all learning. No one has all the answers. Um, that's why every time I do an interview, you do an interview, we all learn together. I always say we all learn. Uh, and so, it, you know, knowledge is key. And um, just being safe in the wood is key. And that's what we're about. We want everybody to have a good time. But we want to be mindful that these creatures, they do exist. Um, and so we just want to be uh, safe about things and still be able to learn all we can about um, these creatures know everything we can yet having a good time in the woods, we can, um, uh, work together, I guess you could say, and, and, uh, kind of, uh, um, live together, so to speak. We're not, all, we're, we're not about just killing these creatures or anything like that. We, we want to learn from them, but, uh, at the same token, I don't trust them. Uh, you've got to be aware that, uh, I do believe that they're, um, responsible for abductions and things like that but that's for another discussion i guess but thank you so much for having me i appreciate the time and i appreciate the invite so much and i'd love to come back on anytime and i think everyone's asking about your youtube so they could just go on your youtube in the next couple of days and you'll have more stuff um more yeah. things Give posted me, on it yes uh, just because of work nowadays i'm kind of hooked up until late at night and uh I'm not the young man I used to be. I can't stay up till four like I used to. I did last night, but I slept in this morning. So if they will allow me a good week, I'll get those on. I promise. Awesome. I appreciate that. And yeah, you're, I mean, you're a chiropractor by, by uh, medical trade. So I appreciate what you do because I go to the chiropractor once a month to get, you know, snap, crackle, popped and adjusted. Cause as as I get older, I, I feel my body getting, you know, whether it's pains or out of alignment and you definitely feel it as you get older. So I appreciate what you do for people because that's a serious health profession. You know, not pe- people realize that you, know, I mean, you can adjust people's sinuses and make them feel better as well. So it's crazy. Yeah. And, and, uh, I'll, I'll officially be retiring, uh, here September 3rd. Oh, wow. 
And so now that doesn't mean I'll stop working. I'll be working still. Uh, I'll be doing some of the things that I've always wanted to do. And so, uh, and then maybe the next show I'll share with you, uh, people will be very interesting, uh, very interested in what I'll be doing next. Definitely. So what's, what's, uh, if you want to shoot for, if you will just keep in touch, we'll probably shoot for maybe mid September. If if that's cool with you. Yeah. Yeah. This is great. Great. I'll stay in touch and we'll just, you know, communicate back and forth if we have been. And, uh, I look forward to it. And thanks again. You have a great blessed night, Lance. Okay. You too. Take care, everybody. Take care, Tom.